Okay, Alex. Welcome. Welcome to episode 27 of the Old Men Magic podcast. I'm going to start this episode today by requesting that new viewers, old viewers, if you haven't subscribed already, so please subscribe to our channel. Please like our video. If you're feeling extra generous, you might even want to hit that notification bell. We're trying to reach our very modest goal of two new subscribers per week. Last week, Alex, we had no new subscribers. No, uh -oh. Two weeks ago, no new subscribers. This past week, one new subscriber. So that was an Good. improvement. Good. Let's see if this week, if I beg the people at the beginning, if we can maybe get two new subscribers to the channel, that'd be fantastic. If we can meet our very modest goal of two new subscribers a week by the end of the year and have over 100 subscribers, Alex, I'd be over the moon. Over the moon. <laughs> That's an elevated position. Yeah. So thanks, everybody. I'm going to thank you in advance for, uh, for subscribing to our channel. Alex, before we get into Magic the Gathering news today, I wanted to talk about some general news that's going on in the world. Oh, okay. I had a busy work week again. I wasn't really paying much attention to a lot of stuff. I came home Friday, very briefly looked at Twitter. I saw Come Town Alaska was trending, so that got me excited. <laughs> I, of course, clicked on that to see what was going on. <laughs> I don't know what that is. And I read on Twitter, this is what Twitter was telling me, that the uh, Department of Defense shot down a, an, an unidentified flying object over the oh. skies of Cumtown, Alaska. And I when I read this, I was like, I don't think this is true, but I'm just going to let myself enjoy this for a little bit. I'm going to not confirm it. I'm just going to, I'm going to sleep on it. I'm going to, you know, enjoy this news for like 12 to 18 hours. I woke up in the morning. Cumtown, Alaska is not a real place. They were screwing with me. Mm. Uh, not me specifically. They were screaming with the whole internet. <clears throat> the government did, though, shoot down another uh, sh shoot down an unidentified flying object over some town in Alaska that is not named Come Town. I will say there are a lot of small towns in Alaska. People probably don't really have much connection to the name. So if there's somebody up there that like lives in a small town in Alaska has some power to change the name. If you wanted to change the name of your town to Come Town, I would suggest it. Second piece of news, Alex, I saw on Friday. I read about an airborne toxic event. <laughs> yes. I heard about this a little bit earlier in the week and I was like, oh, that I don't know what's going on. I'll read about it later. When I started reading yesterday, it sounded a lot worse than I realized it was. It sounds like a very bad situation, actually. So this is a Norfolk Southern uh, uh, Railroad. Mm -hmm. uh, they went off the rails full of toxic chemicals right outside of East Palestine mm -hmm. near where you and I grew up. And the government decided what they would do with these toxic chemicals is burn it off. Mm -hmm. I guess there was some fear. There was pressure building up. There was some fear and an explosion that could possibly send this uh, vinyl chloride, you know, shooting out for a radius of several miles along with shrapnel. They were like, let's burn it off. So they created this giant cloud of toxic phosgene, which is essentially a chemical weapon that they used in World War I to gas enemy troops. And also, what, hydrogen chloride, I think, that when it comes into contact with water vapors in the skies, rains down as hydrochloric acid. So they essentially created acid rain. And I thought, okay, this sounds pretty terrible, but... I don't know how big this cloud was, exactly where it was going. I saw some photographs. It was huge. And I also yeah, talked to my aunt. scary looking. And she said that she saw it like floating over the Southern Park Mall. So like in Boardman. Really? And she could also smell some things from her house in Boardman. Did you, were you able to see this huge cloud of black? I did not smoke? notice it in the sky from here, but I also didn't like deliberately look. Um, mm -hmm. Because it was all over the news here locally. Uh, but I know that people people I know in Columbiana could smell it. 
and they like left town for the night. That's very bad. That's um, did, were you able to smell anything? If I feel like if you no. were able to smell it, that is very very yes. Bad. If you could, yeah. I feel like that. I agree. Yeah, if you can smell that in the air, that is not good. This is. I was like be... watching the weather for like the wind flow direction. Like <laughs> it was going east for the most part, west to east most of the day. I don't know what what it was doing when they burnt that off. But were yeah. they sending it to PA? It seemed like it might have just been direct. For a while, it was blowing up this way. Um, it looked like it was going west more than north, so it would be going like west of us. But it was pretty close, and I don't know how accurate those maps are. So yeah, terrible. Uh, the more I read about it, the the more the the worse it it sounded, and uh, I feel like we're not going to know. Like this makes me really mad. Yeah, I feel like we're not going to know exactly what kind of damage they did to that area for like a good ten years or so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, People have to a, live there, and there's, you know, it's going to be in the water, and yes, that's what I'm worried about. Uh, I was already seeing photographs of just dead fish everywhere in certain creeks really? in that area. Really, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that doesn't surprise me. People's pets were dying. I asked my cousin if her chickens were still alive in her backyard because I was like, "Well, if your chickens are alive, it doesn't mean everything good." But if they're dead, that's very bad, and you should leave. And I don't actually know when people should come back. It sounded like they started. There, they possible. started telling people to come back already, like two days afterwards. And I'm not so sure. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. There's not they much said, to say they about said it a mile. Point. They were like they were evacuating people with like a crazy. mile crazy, and I was like crazy. If it's bad enough to evacuate people within a mile, like. It's definitely bad enough that you don't want to be within a few miles of it. Like, yeah, sure. <laughs> exactly. And then I'm not even sure when you would need to, when you would want to even be able to come. I'm not even sure when you would be able to come back to those areas safely. I don't, I don't even know. They're, they're just going to say, of course, as soon as the burning's over, come back. But yeah, uh, it's, it sounds pretty terrifying. Did you ever read White Noise by Don DeLillo? No. There was an airborne toxic event in that book. It was one of the major plot points in the book. It was, I can't remember if it was a rail accident or a trucking accident that spilled some toxic chemicals that caught on fire and created a toxic cloud that was floating around an unnamed Midwestern Rust Belt city. <laughs> and actually they filmed a movie version of the book a couple years ago and they filmed it in several places all around Ohio. And there was a guy, I, there was a CNN article about this event. They were talking to a guy named Brent Ratner who lives in East Palestine. And he was an extra in that film during the airborne toxic event scene. And now he's living in East Palestine. That's surreal. <laughs> like, uh, like a mile or two, like so, like right in the heart of it, a mile or two from where this derailment occurred, and where the giant black toxic cloud. It was pretty crazy. <laughs> it was nuts. So, uh, I hope everything's not too bad. I was going to say I hope everything's okay, but everybody's not going to be okay. Uh, a terrible. It's a terrible carcinogen. Liver cancers. Uh. I don't know that they that they can tell people what's really going to happen if you breathed in the toxic byproducts of the combustion of uh, vinyl chloride. Like there's, I don't know any studies. There are lots of studies on people who worked with vinyl chloride itself in factories and how they had like massively higher chances of developing all sorts of cancers, mostly like rare liver cancers. But like the burn-offs, who knows? Yeah. On to, um, on to lighter news, Alex. <laughs> Let's talk about Magic the Gathering. I just wanted to ask you about that. I wanted to know if you could see the cloud from where you were at, if you smelled anything at all. I didn't know it was possible to see the cloud from where we were, so or I would have looked, but I also I did not smell anything. And my aunt, I said she saw the cloud over Southern Park Mall. That's not true. She saw photographs that people took of the cloud visible from the Southern Park Mall. So that's different than it actually floating over the Southern Park Mall. But yeah, it makes yeah, me kind of there, like on the roof or something from what they have like those weather cams, you know, they show you like the area in the morning, like from like one of those. Yeah, you could probably see pretty far. She could have been looking at that. 
it makes me kind of terrified about the whole area for a little while. No, it's scary. I don't trust any, like, yeah. I don't trust the they, government. They a guy, they were showing an interview with a rail ra- railway worker. I'm not sure how long ago this was, but he was talking about how, you know, things were, you know, under-maintained and under, <laughs> you know, just, it was a shit show, basically. And he was talking about an accident that had happened in Northeast Ohio. And he's like, luckily it was candle wax and nothing bad, but it's yeah. like just a matter of time before, you know. Yeah, well, they just busted a rail right. strike, right? They just told them they all yeah. had to all get, to get back to work. So you're not we, allowed uh, to have sick days if you're so an important could, uh, railway worker. Isn't that a good reason to have sick days so that you're, you know, not getting your coworkers sick and performing uh, at a high level of, you know, don't you want your employees performing at a high level? This is a conversation that a lot of people have been having, especially since the pandemic. And we've all learned that nobody really gives a fuck. Yeah, no one gives a fuck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if you just get too sick to come back to work, it doesn't matter. Uh, they'll just try to replace you as quickly as possible. And uh, I've had a lot of people at my job coming back to work sick all the time. And it's in- infuriating to me. I'm like, I don't, I don't want you here. And you're right. They don't even yep. do a good job while they're there. Yeah. They're going to make mistakes. If you want, if you, if you're doing important railway stuff that is dangerous, like being a railway conductor or something, I don't want you to be like delusional, like with the flu, like yeah. on medicine, yeah. like, uh, no, but it doesn't matter. It's on. just all about moving forward. Even if you don't do things uh, the right way, as long as it's, they just cross their fingers and hope that it's not too terrible. I see that kind of thing happen yeah. in the place place that I work too. Where we'll we're average so many disasters every you know five to ten years, and we will you know take that into account the cost of those disasters. Yeah, we won't take into account the cost of all the uh, the uh, hospital bills. The, the, the liver cancer are going to accrue. And the dead yeah. fish and the, you know, poisoned river. Nobody will be covered for that. Also, you know, you can't really cover their early demise either. No amount of money yep. is going to really cover that. But anyway, Externalities. It is <laughs> Make the world go around. Me. I could have, we could podcast about this every week where I just scream about stuff. Yeah. That w- I'd be. Uh, All health concerns. Bad for my health. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not as bad as vinyl chloride. Magic. But. <laughs> Let's talk about something lighthearted in the world of Magic the Gathering. You wanted to talk about some secret layers today. This is a an older secret layer, a secret layer that came out like two, maybe three years ago, kind yeah. of at, around the beginning of a secret layer. And that got me thinking about something that has happened with a recent secret layer. So before we get into your secret layer, I wanted to talk about this event. Okay. They just announced their first uh, 2023 super drop, Alex. It's a super drop. And I think they're selling these secret layers for six months. Wow, for that long. This is a trend that I'm seeing. The secret layers, when they first started, I think you told me they were like 24-hour events. And then some of them have been spread out to like a week or, or maybe... Somewhere around there. Yeah, I feel like they're more like that, but I can't remember now. Maybe I'm not sure if I read something on here and I don't remember. But But they're just getting longer and longer, which tells me that the secret layers are probably going to be less and less exclusive, less and less rare. Yeah, if you can order it, I'm very much less excited about something like this. If you can order it for six whole months, that seems like how many of them are they're going to be. If nothing else, I'll wait a long time to get them because prices will go down. Okay, I'm wrong. This is where Steve's wrong again. Okay. Steve's I'm glad wrong. I pulled this up. Winter Super this is Drop 2023. Steve's wrong, is Steve's wrong segment. But hold on, it's still over a month. The sale That's ends still, in 42 days. It's yeah, already been still going a decent on. Amount of time. So I think I was off by a hundred percent. It's probably happening for about a month and a half as opposed to two months. I said two months. But anyways, one of the bundles oh, in I this... you said six months. Sorry, keep going. I did say six months. And then I said something different. (laughs) One and a half months is the correct answer. It doesn't matter. One of the bundles in this winter super drop for 2023 is the snakes drop. And there was a card in this bundle called Stone Coil Serpent. Uh, And Magic the Gathering Secret Layers Twitter account sent out this tweet. The initial image for Stone Coil Serpent in the Snake's Drop had an error that is not reflective of the final product. This has been updated on our website to correct this. 
Customers who purchase the drop will be okay. notified directly as well. So this is the card you're now going to be able to purchase. Okay. And it's like mm -hmm. a, a snake made of cobbled together items with a yeah. skull as the snake's head. There's it's, lots of spikes impaling yeah. different things. On I don't this. know that you could say that it's slithering. Uh, I don't know if that thing can slither, but it's clunking along. It's clunking. Before I saw this tweet, I saw people tweeting out the original image of this card. Okay. Did they take something out? Yeah, they were, and they were goofing on something that used to be offensive? in this card. They removed. It was offensive to some people. I don't know oh. who. Uh, people were goofing on it. I think they were in, enjoying it, uh, but WOTC saw these tweets, and maybe it was the first time they noticed this particular item on this oh. makeshift serpent. Okay, maybe the artist it. tried to slip something in? I don't, it wasn't really hidden or anything. So this is what they removed, and people are not letting them forget about it. Okay. There's giggities. Here we Giggity. go. Never forget what they've taken from us. There was a man impaled on one of these spikes. Yeah. Painfully and impaled. And he's doing the sign of the beast. But I, what really wizards wanted to censor and what some people were offended by, although I don't think anybody was offended by it, was his, his this thing that kind of looks like a tiny little penis. So <laughs> this is... <laughs> this I mean, is what, depending on your perspective, that might just be leg musculature. <laughs> I know. It's not... It's not whether or not it's a penis, it's not like egregious. It's not that could be a lady. What's, what's the word I want to say? It's not really in your face, you know. You have to really zoom in. It's yes. no more offensive than just a doll, it's, like a like a GI Joe or something. Yes. It's, it's barely yeah, more offensive it looks like than a Ken a doll. Joe looks like a Ken doll. doll or something. But that's what Maybe people were talking weird. about, and that's <laughs> when they decided to censor it. They weren't. See. This gets me. Yeah, going about a thing that I notice about magic cards and what they feel like they have to censor and what they don't have. Not to upset censor. about the spike going through the guy's exactly. It's a, it's a, exactly. <laughs> that's totally fine, and we can even leave like impaled skulls and stuff. That's all all right. Meat Hook Massacre is okay, but if there's something that might kind of look like a wiener, we got to <laughs> remove that because this is a children's game, Alex. <laughs> so that's the big news. I'll go back and to the first image. How small would that have been? It was tiny. It was right here. That would be that's pretty small. Yeah. So you had to really you really had to zoom in. You had to take a close look. Yeah. Who's the artist? Some pervert. <laughs> Some pervert <laughs> named Lanes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he slipped he or she slipped any tiny little uh penises anywhere else into their other work. Mm, yeah, Who we knows? should go on a tiny little penis hunt. MTG secret layer better be searching. But that's, you know, that's all I wanted to say about the Winter 2023 Super Drop. I When they first released it, I had a brief glance through them. I wasn't particularly excited about any of them. If you want to look through them at some point and you see some that you like, we could talk about them in a future episode. But there was nothing that got me excited about the artworks or really? the cards in this particular Super Drop. Yeah, I didn't look at it yet. But, but Alex, you wanted to talk about an old Super Drop. I called... did. This is not new news here. That's what we talk about. We Not new news. news. This is from this is news from 2020. Uh, at the end of the year, they had a secret versary, secret lair. Um, this was a series of drops. I'm not sure exactly how that worked, but uh, if this you ordered it all at once and then you got it in chunks, or if you had to order, I'm guessing that's probably how it worked, rather than just being able to order parts of it. But I, I might be wrong. This was two uh, weeks. This was a two week long offering. Yeah, two weeks long. I saw that as well. Um, it's the first anniversary of the Secret Layers, and it introduced the Artist Series, which, a, which is a sub series with a famous artist doing four cards that they illustrate. I don't know if it's always four, but it says four on here. Um, and they apparently have a lot of freedom to do you know what they want. Card uh, launch, some might say. Okay, so yeah, it does card say launch. card launch in the article that we're both looking at. Um, <laughs> The, the wiki uh also okay here we go yeah 24 hour availability of individual drops uh that's probably where i got that information for two from weeks me. so yeah we see that was at one point correct information yeah 24 um, hours to two weeks to now a month and a half they're really stretching this stuff out mm. 
I don't know if that'd yeah. be good or good for them or bad for them. From a collector's perspective, it makes it less exclusive and less rare, yeah, I'm sure. I don't know. I wonder how... See, the thing is, we never know anything about print runs, so yeah. we can't compare because it would be good to know. Like, I do feel like with the, the way they do it now, sometimes they're over before you even find out about them. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're not really paying attention, it's possible to be, you know, busy doing stuff for a week or two, and then you miss the whole thing. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, it seems like there's a pretty active secondary market for these. Um, so, and you know, from what I've heard from like the earliest ones that just had a short window, I wasn't trying to buy these. I wasn't even aware of them at the, at the, at the time, but I've heard people talk about how like the big ones people wanted the, they, there were website problems from stuff. You know, the kind of thing we ran into with the MTG 30th anniversary secret. Layer. Yeah. 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 So that like, you know, they shorten it to the point where not everybody that wants it can get it. So it's, it's obviously a low print run relative to the demand. Uh, but when you stretch that out over six months, it's, I don't know why I keep saying six months, a month and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I see in the future, they're going to go to six months eventually. Probably. Yeah. No, that'd be so long. That's like having a set out, man. The sets don't even stay out for six months at this point. That is true. They'll never go that far. That's true. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the reason I brought this up, because I stumbled across this, because it has a set of Bob Ross lands in it, basic lands. And I thought that was pretty cool. These were oh. super cool. Uh, I just, I wish, I really hope they revisit this. I don't know if they purchased some Bob Ross IP. They probably don't own rights to it. They probably just purchased the rights to like print it in this one, in this one. Probably. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Product. But I, I really... think I saw some news about his estate too, about there being some sort of uh, like contention or fight over it, like the rights to his stuff among his, you know, family or whatever. Yeah. I've heard similar things too. Uh, I really feel like, and you know his his stuff is licensed on so many products. I'm sure, yeah, a tons of stuff. Is it? I see it all over the place, especially when I go in bookstores, calendars, really little tiny desk calendars, cups. I wonder if that all started that after he died, right or if he was doing that when he was alive. I don't Probably know. Probably after he was dead. I'm, I'm sure it it ramped up after he was dead. Yeah. But yeah, I like these. They're pretty. These were pretty cool. Uh, I really wish. I know what you're going to say. I feel like they did them dirty a little bit by putting it on these frames. <laughs> is that, <laughs> did, is that, did you know that's what I was going to oh, say? Well, I thought you were going to say you wish it didn't have the big mana symbol in the text box, which I also don't like. Cause that, I think that yes, clashes I don't want with that. the artwork. It, it, it does. A, you know, it clashes with the artwork on there. And yeah, it the takes frame. Away. The frame takes away. If you just had black frame as opposed to whatever this design is in yeah. between the black and the I think artwork. I should consider that for the artist. I don't know if they do that more now with artist series. They're obviously doing extended the extended art and borderless yeah. kind of stuff more now. So that's good. They could have done like a special frame for him that was like an they easel should've. frame. You know? They should have like done something. sort of like an easel. <laughs> Either do something special like that or go classic for Bob yeah. Ross. Because Bob Ross is an American classic. Yeah. You don't go new frame for Bob Ross. Look at, think, okay, Alex, look at this image. Imagine it with an old Beta Island frame mm -hmm. and without the giant mana symbol. Yeah, better, better, definitely, right? Definitely. Maybe wouldn't just because we're old. wouldn't have as much clash. -ing. Yes, it clashes too much with the artwork. Imagine Clang. this, Alex. I like that. That um, looks so cool. This is great. Imagine it with a Beta frame. I say Beta, just black frame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like these swan. At least that's I can't remember what the other one looked like, but I'm pulling I think it, up it was now. similar. Yeah, I like those because they're like they're mm -hmm. not super super dark or super super spooky like a lot of swamps are. They're it very like moody. they look like a like an American landscape painting. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of cool. It just looks like a painting from October. Let me look at the mountains. See, it looks awful with that big red fireball. It's terrible. At the bottom, like, <laughs> it's terrible. I, that doesn't even look good with red. I was trying to imagine that. No, this one looked good red. This looks good. This looks good with some red in the frame. Yeah. But yeah. No, it's it's too much. It's too much. You guys, you ruined it. Like, I want to say ruined it. I'm sure some people enjoy it. 
the forest also with a black a black beta like frame. Come on now. Come on now. If these had old frames, I would be buying them in a in a heartbeat. I'm mm -hmm. not going to touch these. Yeah, same. I'm not going to touch. Too them. bad. And it, it is a shame. And I hope that uh, Bob Ross's estate sells out a little bit more to Magic the Gathering once again. And so in, they can fix this. <laughs> and when they do so, yeah, tell them to use yeah. the old frame. They're doing it more now, going old frame. Like we've seen the like last it. couple sets, they they mm -hmm. they release old frame things. We saw a lot of it in Brothers War, a lot of it in uh, the one after Brothers War. <laughs> which, the one after that. <laughs> which was the one that was right after Brothers War. It wasn't uh, so it's fracture all but all the area remastered. Yeah, yes, exactly. The whole remastered, the whole remastered set. And I love that stuff, but you know, maybe that's those are products that are probably designed for people like us. Kind of because I have who seen want the people online say they don't like it, like they don't like the old the retro border as much. And I'm kind of like, hey, but whatever, that's them. Yeah, I don't get it. That's what they grew up with, I guess, and we want what we grew up with, but. Yeah. Aesthetics wise, I don't know how anybody would argue that this looks better than it would look with an old black bordered beta style island frame. Yeah. Come or just now. minimal frame, no frame, just like let it be a, you know, that, it's supposed to be a painting. It's a Bob Ross painting. Like, don't. Eh, eh. You're right. I keep saying old frame, but if they just go full art on these. Yeah. And let's get rid of this on. big dumb mana symbol. It's like the, the there are so many cards with blocks of tiny text. People playing this game can read. They expect you to be able to read. We don't need like blue drop <laughs> to like tell you, you know. Yeah, it doesn't need to be tap for a blue mana. <laughs> it doesn't need to be the most prominent item on the card. That's the problem. It's, like, it's yeah. bigger than everything else. It's yeah. just like it overwhelms it, the whole card. It's the least interesting piece of art on the card, and it's yeah. what your eye is drawn to first because they make it so prominent. Yeah. This this secret anniversary also had squirrels in it. Yes, uh, that's uh, another reason I wanted to talk about it because we were just talking okay. about squirrels, and there's several squirrel ones in there. Do you have any in particular you wanted to talk about? I believe Cross and Beast was the coolest to me, but I can't remember all of them. I did look at them from a, from a playability perspective. None of these seemed all that great. I don't know if they get a lot of play in squirrel decks or not. Cross and Beast, three colorless, one green. A squirrel beast, one one. Threshold, frozen beast gets gets plus seven plus seven as long as seven or more cards are in your graveyard. I don't know how often that happens. I've looked at threshold cards and I'm like, I don't. They don't seem to get a lot of play, but a lot yeah. of play. And when you got to play, when you got to pay four mana for a one drop, like I I'm I would play a threshold card and I'm searching for threshold cards that are like this that that are costed well for their base. Even without the threshold functions, yeah, 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 and the the threshold has to be like a bonus if the game lasts that long. But something like this, where it's a four drop for one one, and it's awesome if you have seven or more cards in your graveyard. But yeah, how often are you going to? Well, you're you're, you're going to if you're playing the right deck. But is that yeah. deck ever going to be a squirrel deck? Well, sure, why not? A green, a fast green weenie type deck. You probably have. You know, you know what I'm going to say. I, I don't know. <laughs> lots of little creatures that will pile up in your graveyard. Lots of instants like giant growth type things. Instants, um, otherwise, yeah. like sorceries or instants that bring more tokens into play. Uh, I don't know. I feel like green's the best color to work. It would have to be full of low cost sorceries. It would have to be full of low-costed sorceries. Even giant growth. I don't just like blow my giant growth at the beginning. Of no, the no, of course not. I'm just saying, like, I'm just, you know, in a deck where you have little creatures that die and you have yeah. spells, you know. I've never tried to build one. Maybe if I started to get into trying yeah. to build a threshold deck, I'd, it would it would be easier I, than I. Than I don't I think. think I see it too much in decks that people are playing, but I also I, it seems like in comments on some of these older cards that people seem to be okay with the mechanic they don't hate it like they aren't like worried about it not happening so you might just have to be building around it you know yeah i don't i don't i don't see it get a lot of play in uh the pre-modern stuff that I've i believe it's going either. to come up again later hmm. chatter of the squirrel was another 
one green sorcery, create a one, one green squirrel token flashback for one colorless and one green. So you can cast it again from your graveyard. So basically you could pay three mana to get two, one, one squirrel tokens. Doesn't seem great. Squirrel mob. One colorless, two green. I like the art on this one. Yeah, it's neat. Two, two squirrel, squirrel mob gets plus one, plus one for each other. Squirrel on the battlefield. That's not bad at all. This is a, this, my favorite one so far, probably. For three mana, yeah, he, he'll be pretty decent sized. Three mana, two, two, that you should be able to pump pretty easy. This one's adorable. Squirrel Wrangler, two colorless, two green, human druid, two, two. One colorless, one green, sacrifice a land. Create two, one, one green squirrel token creatures. One colorless, one green, sacrifice a land. Squirrel creatures get plus one, plus one till end of turn. This is the kind of card that I've been, I've been seeing a lot recently and it's like getting me excited about trying to build a deck based around this type of mechanic where you sacrifice a land but i don't know why i want to do that because every time i sit down to do it i'm like this is just terrible it's funny that you say that because there's something that i'm looking at that involves sacrificing lands too i want to sack a land to bring it back sack a land to bring it back or destroy lands but bring mine back and have my opponent not be able to bring his or hers back but then every time i start brewing messing around thinking about doing that i'm thinking to myself why don't i just build a deck that tries to get my opponent from 20 points to zero points of life <laughs> that doesn't involve me needing to sacrifice my lands and then bring them back yeah <laughs> yeah it's just like a ton of extra work for what what reason? I just mostly because here's why I just want to try to get it to work. That's part of the yeah, fun. Of magic. It's just I, an angle for a deck that's going to, you know, it's a combo like anything else that you're, you know, I like is going to be casual, but I like to try to build suboptimal decks or decks with like suboptimal mechanics or suboptimal themes, but try to make them as good as I can make them. Yeah, I think it's fun. I think a lot of people do. That's why there's so much, you know, discussion about casual. Yeah casual deck building exactly. otherwise it would be boring and people would just play the same few yeah, decks all yeah. the time and that is what happens in tournaments i think and like competitive yeah. magic pro tour it's the same few mm -hmm. kind of slight variations on them maybe or every yeah. once in a while someone switches something up crazy and it's like whoa yeah yeah swarm yard i don't know this one at all swarm yard. that's a weird name oh it's a land i was going to be like what's this color land a squirrel land tap to add one colorless Tap to regenerate target insect, rat, spider, or squirrel. That's very weird. Yeah. What uh? What set did that first come out? In? Could I put this in a pre-modern squirrel deck? No. no. This seems like a modern card for sure. That's some bullshit. <laughs> Time spiral. Not its original, obviously. Oh, see, just a secret later in Time Spiral. Weird. I'm confused by that because I thought Time Spiral was a reprint series. It is, I think. I, unless there's new cards in it, too. I think it's the other way around. It was a secret layer first, and then they Time Spiraled it? What are the dates? We need to do some. I can never. One thing about MTG stocks, the dates are always so blurry that yeah. you can't actually tell. It looks like it's a 1995, but that would not be right. Because Time Spiral did not come out in 1990. Did it? Were we totally unaware of the existence of Time Spiral while we were playing? This is Time Spiral Remastered. It was, no, that's... The, no, this is, this is Time Spiral. Here's uh, what I'm going to do. I see. I'm going to go to Scryfall. Scryfall, the resolution's better. What was this call, called again? Swarm Yard. Time spiral. Oh, oh, it's one of these things, the dash, 93 to 2006, yeah, yeah. which I don't know why I do that. So what does that mean when I see that? What 2006 what then. Why do they do that? Oh. From the beginning of Magic to when the card was printed. Bizarre. I, because I guess, I don't know. It's, it's weird that it's inconsistent. They don't do that on everything, but. Yeah, the earlier the, the range could be so they protect things like mechanics of the game or like, you know, keyword things in the game or, you know, the name of the game overall and stuff. 
Okay, so well, that's I can't. Bird. If I wanted to build a pre-modern squirrel deck, I can't put Swarm Yard in there. That's a bummer. And there's also one named Squirrel, which is just a token. And I've heard about some of these tokens being like pretty expensive. I don't know if the Squirrel token is expensive. Puffy Gator. Puffy Gator painted this cute little squirrel. Disney looking squirrel. I like that squirrel token. Other things in this secret layer, Alex, that I didn't pay any attention to. A box of rocks. I wasn't so excited about that one. I don't know any of these cards. I won't be playing any of these cards. The art I didn't totally love. I So this was weird. I thought this box of rocks one was weird to me because it's like, it's all these mana rocks, okay? Mm -hmm. um, that looks nice. Arcane sig yeah, that's kind of neat. Which one? Uh, let me look at them again to refresh myself real fast. Arcane signet, yeah. chromatic lantern, commander sphere, dark steel, dark steel ingot, ingot, and gilded, gilded lotus. lotus. Yeah. Um, what's weird to me about these is that they're 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 all different artists too, so it's not like this was just one person's weird take. But yeah, they're all mana rocks, but the art on the card is for most of them kind of highlighting something other than the mana rock. Like that's the skeleton. That's a skeleton. That's yeah. like a, a toad. And it's is holding, he holding the rock. The rock? Yeah. Then yeah. there's the gilded Lotus and it's this winghead lady girl. And she's standing over the gilded Lotus. That one, like there's a lot going on. Arcane signets, the one that features the mana rock the most in the card. I feel yeah. like and that it's is still different. Barely you know, it, it's still it is different a lot than, uh, than most mana rocks. The art for most mana rocks. Yeah. At least the old school, what we're used to. Right, right. Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on in this these art these pieces of art. Uh, and and the mana rock is kind of like not really the star of the art. It's a little bit weird. I'm not saying it's bad. Just it was just an observation. Yeah, and then the party hard shred harder was another uh, block yes. in here. I don't love this. They've revisited the they revisited this art, even though I did like it yeah. for Necropotence mm -hmm. uh, in the Secret Layer. They did something very similar to like this uh, to this, uh -huh. right? Yeah, the, for the, the most part, I don't love it because it doesn't remind me enough of a Magic card. It yeah, doesn't it's, feel it's a like a game too piece. Different to me, yeah. It's too much like a what this was trying to mimic uh, a, a music poster. I'm assuming. Yes, exactly. It looks like a poster. Um, the one I was gonna talk about uh, the very last one at the bottom it looks like uh it looks like a movie poster like a promotional direct to mundar I mean? like this movie's coming out soon you know yeah like for me to even figure out what this is i'm like hold on a second yeah the the the, the things aren't in like the places you want them to be like the one above that dread bore the mana symbols are right in the middle of the card direct to mundar cast for four colorless one blue one black one red but it's I mean, I like the creature, artwork. Zombie it's very, they're creative, cool, like pieces of art, you know, for a skateboard or a poster. Yeah. Uh, I just, you know, I don't personally love them for a card. I wouldn't really want to run these in a deck, but they're cool. You know, props to the artists. Yeah. But other than the Bob Ross lands, the coolest part of this particular drop was the artist series. And this was the introduction of the artist series, like you already said. And the artist series is like one of my favorite things. It's probably my favorite thing about the secret layers. When I find an yep. artist that I really like that, that put together some artwork for some cards. I like the yeah, fact that they, neat. they give them carte blanche. Yep. Uh, they let them choose the card that they want to illustrate. They want to produce art for. And then you get like unique arts, new arts, new art treatments for several cards from an artist that you really enjoy. So this first one, they chose Seb McKinnon, who has some awesome fucking art. He, yeah, some of this stuff's cool. I don't know that he did anything from like the era that we were playing, but I've started looking at some of his art from new frame cards from the modern era, and it's fantastic. Uh, so for this drop, he did Sower of Temptation. Don't know what this card is. It's not in my wheelhouse. Yeah, I didn't pay attention to that too much because it's out of my wheelhouse. <laughs> Modern card. Two colorless, two blue, fairy wizard, two, two flying. When Star of Temptation gains the or enters the battlefield, gain control of target creature for as long as Star of Temptation remains on the battlefield. It's a uh, flying control magic on a stick. 
Damnation. I've seen this art before. This, this is cool. Is I like this one. This, yeah. Hieronymus Bosch esque. Yeah. Two colorless, two black sorcery, destroy all creatures that can't be regenerated. It's a classic spell. Actually, this. Oh, it even says Hieronymus Bosch right here. I like the original art for Damnation too. I think if it's what I'm remembering, it was one of the first art works for a modern card that I saw when we got back into magic. It's just like a bright white sphere. Like oh, middle. that's this one. Yeah, yeah, I love this one. Yeah, it's like a white back. It's a dark sphere, like a black hole almost, like a black orb. Yeah. And it's sucking everything into it, and it's like all white in the back. That's really cool. It looks like what Damnation would be. So I was like, yeah. that's great art. I like this too a lot. Enchanted Evening, three colorless. When they do this mana symbol that's like white or blue, it means you can pay either one, right? Yeah. That's my understanding. Three colorless, white or blue, white or blue. Enchantment. All permanents are enchantments in addition to their other types. Hmm. <clears throat> Probably a lot you could do with that. Yeah. And then the coolest was the swamp. Yeah, I thought this sweet. was awesome. They did a swamp. Again. This was sweet. <clears throat> uh Old style frame would be sweet, but I like that they gave this for treatment. Yeah, yeah. That's good. They should have done the same thing with the Bob Ross lands. They should have done yeah, the same thing. With the Bob. I agree. Did you see the one, the version of this down lower that's the sketch version? It's kind of like all the way at the bottom. No. Check it out. Check it out. I'm going to do that. Extra. So this is a bonus go. card. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is like an intermediate uh, version of the final I artwork. guess, yeah. But it's kind of, I mean, it's a little less col colorful, but it's kind of, I like it as much. Maybe, I'm not sure which one I like more. Yeah. I wonder what these go for, if you wanted to. Yeah, I don't know. I fill your deck this, with uh, seven stuff. McKinnon swamps. I'm going to look that up real quick. I can edit if it takes me too long to, to find the information. <laughs> I don't know how, how easy it's going to be. We'll what? find it. Oh, we're going to find it, Steve. We're going to find it. I don't know how Here easy, uh, how I quickly. Found it oh, wow. Did you find it on TCG Player? I think so, yeah. Did you just type in Swamp, what, Seb McKinnon? Yeah, I typed in Swamp Seb. Look at you. We Alex. are looking at, there's 69 Nearmint ones for sale for 7 or $8. Is it 539 or 119 There were two different ones. What? I, it, oh, I, oh I that was 119 options. 119 is the full version. Oh, okay. Five thirty nine is the uh, the sketch version. And yeah, I was just about to look that one up. How much is the other one going for? Seven or eight dollars. Near mint. This one's four twenty. Oh, it's even less. It, okay. Everybody, there's like four people selling it for four twenty. Oh. And then it's five forty nine, four ninety nine. Yeah, so that's cheap. Okay. I would have thought that one would be rarer, right? I don't know how you got that one. It was. Wouldn't they be equally rare? Didn't it say it came as a bonus card with every... So wouldn't there be one of these in every the drops, in every kit? The drops can be bought separately or in one of three bundles. Okay. Uh, I guess it depends how they were bundled. Foils. Bonus card. As an extra, each drop comes with a surprise bonus card. I'm assuming you only get the illustrated sketch version of the Swamp if you buy the Seb drop. And each sub drop comes with the original swamp and the illustrated one. If this comes as an extra with each drop. So, so would they be equally as rare? I'm not sure. For starters, could you buy just that sub McKinnon one by itself? Or did you get all of these together like as a block of them? Okay. That's what I don't understand. I don't know the answer to that either. As an extra, each drop comes with a surprise bonus card, and it can be one of five cards. Oh, okay, you know, you're right. It is. I think these are separate. So the drops could be bought separately or in one of three bundles. You just read this. Okay. The yeah, no foils, yeah, I understand that. no nonsense bundle for $99.99 includes one copy of each drop, except for the squirrels. The Foils Forever Bundle includes one copy of each drop available on foil, so everything except Party Harder, Shred Harder. The Bundle Bundle combines the other two bundles. So it sounds like you could buy them in one of three bundles. Each of those three bundles will include the Seb McKinnon card. Yeah, because this is saying, so each one of the, the 
artist series. I don't know what uh, I'm lost now on what to call each of the individual ones, but some of them have a choice, like a random card out of five or whatever. And then some of them just have one. So this one says it, it looks like every one comes with the sketch swamp. So they should exist in a one-to-one ratio. I would think. I would think so too. But then like the squirrels one, you get one of five different planeswalkers that are in the stained glass version. Oh. Um, and then the box of rocks, you get one random stained glass planeswalker out of five. Each <laughs> they're the first letter of each <laughs> of their names spells rocks. So there's an R letter, an O letter, <laughs> a C letter, a K letter. Okay. <laughs> it's on here. If you scroll down, you can see all this. So the swamp. There you go. Eh, I mean, it's not that expensive, but it's way too expensive for me to fill a deck with those swamps. Oh, yeah. I would only ever put like one in anyways, yeah. I think. I wouldn't if we were talking a buck or something, I'd be like, okay, I'm buying. Yeah. I'm not buying $5 swamps right now. Did you see the Evolving Wilds, Bob Ross? That's an interesting one. Happy Little Gathering, Evolving Wilds, illustrated by Bob Ross with one of his typical quotes. We don't make mistakes, just happy little accidents. I make a lot of mistakes. Uh, Bob Ross used to tell say things to me like that as a child, and uh, turns out the rest of the world didn't agree with him. <laughs> I'm always being told I'm screwing everything up all the time. He might have only been speaking within the context. Of <laughs> only <art>. painting. <laughs> Creativity. Yeah. Sacrifice Evolving Wilds. Search your library for a basic land card, put it into the battlefield tap, then shuffle your library. Me. 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 Okay. <laughs> a little bit of a mana fixer, I guess. Yeah. So, I don't know. I thought that was pretty interesting. It was a good super drop, Alex, and it got me thinking about Seb McCannon art. And I want to show you a YouTube video that I okay. watched for the first time a few months ago. When we first got back into magic, I was searching YouTube for information, trying to learn about what had happened when we had been had been away. One of the big uh, YouTubers in the Magic the Gathering space is a guy named Ristic Studies. And he puts out like really nicely edited videos on special topics. Each one has a theme. Some of his videos focus on particular art artists. And he made one on Seb McKinnon, the magic art of Seb McKinnon. And I thought it was really good. I don't think you've ever seen it. So I wanted to watch it with you today. Ristic Studies, hopefully you don't, hope, hopefully this doesn't get pulled down if Alex and I watch this together. <laughs> if it does, I guess I'll edit it out from a later version. We also aren't monetized. So we're not stealing anybody's work for money. Here we go. Fair use. Hopefully. <laughs> Tell me if you can hear this or if it's too loud, Alex. Okay. Let's see how well my internet holds up. Apparently, Seb McKinnon also does some short films. Short high fantasy films. What you are watching is a scene from a new chapter in the Kin Fables tale titled The Stolen Child. How does that sound, Alex? Five years ago in 2013, <laughs> well, Project Kin, an no. atmospheric short film <laughs> that, that followed you... a young girl, the volume a faceless <laughs> knight on a pale white horse, and a circle of dancing spirits that linked their two worlds together. Kin went on to win Best Cinematography at the Fantasia International Film Festival in the Quebec short film category later that same year. The success of the picture led brothers Ben and Seb. This reminds me very much of a Miyazaki into a trilogy, creature. Introducing both modern and high fantasy. I mean, I feel like there was a creature the that looked almost exactly like that and spirited it away potentially. Yeah, yeah. It was like a black kind of soundscape and built the narrative in all three parts. And after losing his brother in late 2016, Seb has revived the world with an outstanding installments that hints at future chapters. This one is dedicated to Ben. I introduce and lead with these short films because I would like to talk about atmosphere and mood in this video. When one explores Seb McKinnon's work for magic, 
Mood is perhaps the most immediate quality that ties his pieces together and separates them from the rest. By looking at his cinematography, as well as the artists that influence him to paint, we can better understand how he develops the eerie, ephemeral worlds we see in his commissions. We can also get an idea of the power in conceptual art that ignores the tenets of realism in favor of leaning into the imaginary. Sweet. I really like all of his art. It's it's awesome. Yeah, it's very awesome. it's like very classic, but high fantasy and gothic at the same time. Very spooky. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is about it. It's a. Uh, I don't know if it's. Oh, they'll talk about this. I'll, I'll, I'll never mind. I'll bring that up later in the video because they talk about it later. Here we go. Ultimately, I would like to talk about Seb's art because it presents a world of high fantasy without being bound to the rules and traditions of magic. Everything's very 2D. Seb McKinnon grew up in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. At least a lot of it is. I like that art style. Creative younger brothers. As kids, they made up Map Game, an imaginary role-playing game that utilized sketches of knights and armies to tell their stories, and played it everywhere they went. Eventually, the boys found magic. Seb was drawn to the illustrations and collected cards accordingly despite not knowing how the game worked. Given the energy in the family to pursue anything outside of the creative art. I wonder how many people over the years have collected magic just for the art and they didn't even play. Yeah. He might have eventually played, I don't know. ...as a career would have been remiss. So Seb enrolled in technical school, got a... I mean, we know people who bought cards all the time just because of them, just because of the art that was on them. And then just go on a binder. Yeah. A degree in operation and design at Dawson College and snagged a job at Ubisoft after graduating. He worked on the concept team for the Rainbow Six franchise before landing his first commission with Wizards of the Coast in 2012. Attended Night in the M13 core set was Seb's first illustration, which aligned with the medieval Arthurian worlds that set the foundations for his love for fantasy. The image shows a knight atop an adorned horse beside a soldier carrying her lance and shield, both situated amidst a garden within the walls of a castle. Alex, you need to start editing our videos like this. You need to get good at all this fancy stuff. The mood is hopeful and valiant. Seb used a palette of pastels across the piece, dropping light from above to highlight the power pose of the knight. The castle walls break in the background to center and draw our eyes. Do we do power poses in the morning, Alex? If you're feeling particularly bad? You need some energy for the day. You ever get in front of the mirror? Do your power pose? No. You should give it a try. It doesn't work. You should give it a try anyways. <laughs> There's a whole TED talk on this lady. I actually wrote a book about the power pose. It's a bunch of bullshit, but whatever. <laughs> the garden is full of growth. The sky has thick, wispy clouds, and all seems well in the kingdom. This piece debuted just after the Innistrad block, which as a whole could serve as the antithesis of the mood found here. It is also one of McKinnon's favorite planes, one where he feels most at home. Since attended night, Seb has provided art for nearly 100 cards, and a strong majority of these pieces show dark, eerie, melancholic compositions. Art directors continually assign him black cards because of his ability to turn the macabre into something beautiful. I love Entomb. Yeah, that, that looks good. I like the original. I, I really like the, they put out a full art version of it too for dominaria or dominaria mastered which is super cool but this is just an absolute classic it's so eerie it makes sense when we look at his influences within the visual arts mckinnon credits the legendary swedish fairy tale artist of the early 20th century john bauer for his inspiration the flat plains the washed out watercolor palettes and the slightly haunting dreamy imagery is synonymous with seb's style he also credits Ivan Solyev as a contemporary artist he admires. Solyev's work taps into the strange and uses monochromatic figure work to generate a sense of dread in viewers. And Alan Lee, a concept artist for the Lord of the Rings film trilogy, mixes tightly rendered landscapes with much looser atmospheric elements like fog, water, and light to breathe life into the fantasy world. I love Alan Lee. Uh... Back in like the 90s at some point, I walked into Barnes & Noble and they had put out a big three volume, like a clamshell uh, uh, version of the of the uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy with like a big clamshell case, all with Al Alan Lee illustrations. Mm. And I've kept it really nice over the years. It's probably like the only thing that I bought new that has now become a collectible. I'm now that old. Oh. 
but it's awesome. The artwork on that in that version of Lord of the Rings is awesome. I'll never be able to afford like a really awesome, really sweet collectible uh, copy of any of the older fancy collectible versions of Lord of the Rings. But I got that one. Yeah. I'm psyched about it. McKinnon employs these same elements in his work as well, which has become a staple of his style. Most of his illustrations depict characters outside, either grappling with some manifestation of the natural world or emerging from it like an extension of its essence. It makes sense that his admiration for Newfoundland, where he enjoys filming because of its picturesque and otherworldly landscapes, would trickle into his art. Moss is the motif that gives growing ranks its mysterious mood, and fire and lightning generate chaos and destruction in Vandal Blast. But perhaps the most useful and significant elements for Seb's narrative are fog and water. With these two devices, he is able to keep his renders loose and expressive, and heavily tap into the abstract. In the early, I need to take advantage of that more when I try to paint or draw. I'll just be like everybody's; they're enveloped in a cloud of fog. That's why nothing looks very <laughs> <Right>? well defined. <laughs> that's definitely not what he's why he's doing it, but that's why I'm going to start doing it. The days fog and water could help set the scene and do exactly as you would expect. Millennial gargoyle, for example would certainly read differently without that heavy white blanket beneath him, which renders this creature quite threatening despite his withdrawn posture. Unknown Shore is one of my favorite pieces in the game, is also different without that stringy mist that wraps around the seashells like tinsel. Vaporkin goes all in on the texture and cautiously draws the viewer in. Is she to be trusted, we may ask? This character, like the gargoyle, is withdrawn, shy, reserved, and eerie. Many of McKinnon's subjects are. They are not imposing, but instead tap Is my internet going to go out? Quiet. If we think back to Kubrick, aren't these the much more ter terrifying characters? Not the ones that scream and surprise us through jump scares, but instead the immobile ones that say nothing at all. This ideal... The scariest Kubrick characters are those two creepy girls who just stand in the hallway of The Shining. Oh. <laughs> also, how? leads me to what I believe was Seb's first standout artwork in Magic, Odunus River Trawler. The piece depicts a char character who is able to bring back the dead, and is doing so in a frighteningly calm way. Apart from a dozen or so hands emerging from the still water, there is no movement. The character is outside in a barren, open swamp that shows very little signs of life. Like Stephen Belladin's work, this landscape is heavily grounded oh, in the I was going to pause on something. And without the creature in the center of the frame, it would work beautifully as a basic land for the game. That's cool. I really, I really, this one is incredibly eerie. And I really like how you can almost see through him. You can see the landscape through him in some areas, almost like he's only ex like halfway existing in this plane and another plane. Like he's almost not there. I like how flat he managed to make it look, you know, like how he captured the like flatness of that like swampy plane. Game. This is a really to good identify one, the mood. We can ask ourselves, how does this make me feel? Or perhaps nervous? How would it feel to be there? To me, this piece is so shit myself because it requires this one right here is terrifying. Yeah, that's sweet. Traditionally in magic and in folklore, these creatures are menacing and angry, hellishly pursuing the living to exploit their desires. McKinnon, that one's kind of neat. I've seen that before. I think that's a taken aback and high Kamigawa card, maybe. Behind him are a series of cyclones. This demon is coy. He's like, what are you looking at? <laughs> I like all the cyclones in the back of that. That's, so that's, the, mo that's the most terrifying part of it, almost. Yeah. <clears throat> There's some point in this video, too, where he mentions that uh, people ask him questions a lot about whether or not this is digital. And I got... Uh, the impression from some point in this video that a lot of this is digital, if not all of it digital. I don't know if that's true. Could that possibly be true? Because oh, when I, I when Probably I look at, at this his, point, but I don't know. When I looked at his art, I was like, oh, I like somebody that still works in colored pencil or watercolor or oil mm -hmm. paint because I feel like I see all of those things in this in his art. But maybe it's just all digital, and that's awesome. Really, it could be it, both. You know, it could be it like. Could be. 
That's true. A lot of people do start with a sketch and then they use digital part just for the coloration. Uh, and in those cases, I feel like it's obvious what, what I'm seeing there, but I suppose you could do the same thing uh, just with the, the brush stroke, the lines and everything too. You could get some lines down on a canvas or on paper with paint or pencil or ink, mm -hmm. and then you could add to it, layer it, modify it uh, digitally somehow. I don't know how any of that works, but. If you could make something like this, I'm sure some, I guess some people can make things that look like this in, in a digital format. That's awesome. Anyways, I really liked a lot of his art. I really like this guy's videos, especially the well, the ones he does on particular artists. Yeah, this is a cool video about all about uh, the different art here. But that's about all I want to say about Seth McKinnon. I think, that, I think we showed most of the really cool art that's in this video. See here, she's talking about a demon still. There's one that I don't think is actually featured in this video. Oh, this is a cool one. I don't That's know what neat. card this is for. <clears throat> Let me pull up another one. I can search for him in uh, Scryfall. There's another card that he did. I, don't, I think it's a pretty famous card. I don't know if it's famous just because of the art uh, that he painted for it or if because it's a highly played card too. I don't remember what it's called, but I'll, I'll recognize it when I see it. Blood Crypt. Spooky. Innistrad, is, this a, is it a vampire theme set? Yeah. Okay. It's like sort of like Ravenloft in D&D in &D is my impression of it. Alex, Kumbaj Wishes. Imagine this with yeah. old frame. Oh. That's sweet. We saw we saw this before be somewhere, frame. but we probably did. Yeah. Yeah, that looks that's cool. Cool picture. Here we go. Farewell. This is a piece of his that I really like. That's pretty neat. Farewell. Four colorless, two white, sorcery. Choose one or more. Exile art all artifacts, all creatures, all enchantments, exile all graveyards. This probably does get a lot of play too. This is one of my favorites. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Anyways, that's all I have to say about this secret versary and Seb McKinnon's art. Cool. What is this? <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> this is like reminiscent of that terror artwork that we yeah, saw. Yeah, right? Right? Yikes. Weird. Even more terrifying, probably. <laughs> okay. Next topic, Alex. You said you wanted to say some things about a couple cards. <clears throat> Torment, maybe some others. Yeah, um, maybe some others. I'm not sure. I think it was all just Torment. Okay. Um, I came across a card the other day, and it is called Possessed Centaur. Oh, not Torment. Okay. I don't know well, Torment. This is from Torment. Uh, oh, oh, the set. Yeah. Okay. The set Torment. Yeah, not the card Torment. Sorry. Possessed. Minotaur. Centaur. Centaur. From Torment. From Torment. It is a rare. It is two colorless, two green, three, three creature. It's the Centaur Horror. It has trample. It has threshold. Possessed Be Centaur back. gets plus one, plus one, is black, and has two colorless, one black tap to destroy target green, green creature. Jeez Louise. I feel like I butchered that. But you get the point. It does a lot of stuff. <laughs> it does a lot of stuff. It's a 3-3 three, three that becomes 4-4 four, four black and has a target destroy green creature ability on it if the, the threshold, threshold was activated. Yeah, one threshold. Um, I noticed this was the first one I came across, and I realized that it was a small cycle of four cards in Torment. Um, there's a green, a white, a blue, and a red. Are they all horrors? Like, is they that the are. cycle? I believe they are. And they all have an ability that turns them black and gives them that two colorless, one black, and they are able to destroy the color that they used to be. So the white one can now destroy white creatures, the red one, etc. It's um, a very weird cycle. Yeah. They are, the other ones are Possessed Barbarian.
Possessed Barbarian. Mm-hmm. Two He's colorless, three, three. two red. Are they all 3-3? Three, three? He has first strike. Yeah. Okay, so they probably have different abilities. Yeah. The blue one's going to phase or some shit. I think it's flying, but I may be wrong. Probably. We'll check it out. Threshold Possessed Barbarian gets plus one, plus one is black and has two colorless black tap to destroy target red creature. Now, check, take a look at the art in this. I didn't notice it at first, but someone pointed out, like, above him and to the left, you have that, uh-huh. like, shadowy, like, you know, yeah. apparently the thing that's possessing him, this, like, demonic spirit. Well, um, in the centaur, you could see the you could see the reflection in the in the pond. Yeah, there was, like, some spooky, yeah. like, black, and I didn't notice that at first. I noticed it when I went back to it uh, after I saw this. But in the comments of this uh, on Gatherer, they said they compared it to, there's a little segue, a little side a uh, little tangent here. Uh, the card Silhouette from Legends. Oh, yeah. Um, it does look a lot like it. looks it. just like that guy. Like that's, The card is basically just like a shadow with a red eyes and mouth. It looks jack-o'-lantern-y like that um, in Legends. Uh, I'm very focused on this guy's cod piece. He has like a goblin oh, yeah. head cod piece. That's, does he? Is that <laughs> all on him? That's like his <laughs> It looks like it. I don't know armor? if it's a goblin head or not. But... Is he standing behind? You know, that is, he's wearing that. He, yeah. I think he's wearing That's weird. <laughs> awfully ostentatious for a barbarian yeah don't you think <laughs> um what are the other ones possessed possessed, Aven? possessed Aven? Aven? yeah let's do that one next because it's blue blue flying yeah red eyes i have seen this one before oh, i I've... came across this because when i was searching for bird soldiers oh so I didn't oh, find it as part of a cycle, but bird it's a soldier bird horror. soldier horror. Wow. Three, three flying threshold gets plus one, plus one is black and has paid two colors, one black tap to destroy target creature. Someone in the comments of this one said that it saw some play in Psychotog decks, maybe as a sideboard, I guess, so that you could beat people in mirror matches by destroying okay. their blue creatures. Okay, so this is... Uh... <coughs> We were talking about threshold earlier. Psycho, a, a deck that's put around Psychotog. That's a case where you would probably reach threshold because Psychotog is all about trying to cast low casting cost spells frequently, cantrips to fill up your graveyard to pump Psychotog. But yeah, if you don't get the Psychotog out or if you have trouble with Psychotog, if you have other cards in your deck that benefit from threshold, that would be a way to take some sort of advantage of all the cards that you've played into your graveyard. Separate from the Psychotog. And 3-3 three, three flying, like you were saying, is the threshold, like the basic card without the <laughs> threshold. This is not too bad, not bad. for a 3-3 three, three flyer. <laughs> Especially if you have it in a bird soldier deck already, where yeah, maybe yeah, you're true. pumping birds, pumping soldiers, yeah. something like that. Birds. Pumping birds, birds, pumping soldiers. Was Possessed Portal one of them? No. Although let's look at that just because it's there. No. It's probably a different. It's probably, probably modern. Totally yeah. Well, terrible. Yeah, get out of here. Yeah. Get off my lawn. Uh, the other one was possessed nomad, and this has another cool. Same with the artwork has the the like mirror image of him on the ground. I think is neat. It looks like a. It's more demonic. It's like yeah. That. It's pretty cool. Attacking does not cause possessed nomad to tap. Yeah. Is threshold right? All the same stuff. Yeah. yeah. The, the flying one is the best. The what? The flying one is the best. Probably. I think the green with trample isn't bad. Yeah, but when I when it's just paired with a 3-3, three, three, it's it's not bad. But w- yeah, when we're yeah. talking 3-3, three, to... three, if I'm thinking what base what a base ability do I want to go along with that 3-3? Three, three? Do I want it to be vigilance, trample, first strike, or flying? I think I'm almost always going to pick the flying. Yeah. Oh. The red one should have been haste. That would have been good. What did we go through? We went through red. four. Now here's the catch. This is why I want to talk about torment. There's no a bit. black one. There's no black one. Okay. Um, and I was like, why isn't there a black one? Or I was like, is it not coming up? So I tried to search, and I found this. I'm freaking out, Alex. Here. There's no black uh, one. I'm no freaking out. One. Tell me why there's no black one. I'm going to tell you why, Steve. Um, I found this article, and it had some of like the backstory behind the torment set, and I browsed through it a little bit because I don't care a whole lot. Um, uh. But it said, did you know that Torment is known as Magic the Gathering's black set? Um, Unlike pretty much every other set with a more or less balanced 
which are more or less balanced between the colors, Torment was deliberately black heavy due to its thematic mechanical emphasis on the color. Um, mm-hmm. there That's where all the four- tainted lands came from. They're all yes, Torment lands. Yes, yeah. I was going to get to that. There are 40 black cards, 28 blue cards, 28 red cards, 21 white cards, and 21 blue cards. Um, plus, a lot of those cards, like you see with these, have black abilities on them or synergize mm-hmm. with black cards somehow. And then you have the five non-basic lands, which are the uh, tainted lands, which all work with black. I thought that was kind of interesting. But why is and, there no why is there no black card in this cycle? Did I did I miss the part where you explained? I think I think the idea was that uh, no no they didn't explain that really. I th- I was reading between the lines and it was kind of like well the set was mostly black already anyways, too much. and these were just a way for them to make cards in the other colors that synergize with black. See what I'm saying? Okay, yeah, they do synergize. Yeah, because you yeah. pay the black mana to yeah. synergize something. might not be the best word for it, but you know, like they work with, you know, they work in a multicolored deck that has black and other colors. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, and then it had a quote. Uh, let's see here if I lost it from Mark Rosewater. Apparently, they think they didn't even do it far enough. He said, uh, Yeah, I don't think we went far enough like with that design. They felt like the, the theme for the, the set still didn't, you know, come through as much as they wanted it to. Do better, Mark. Do better. <laughs> um, let's see. Have they done anything like similar this? with other sets where like the set was mostly like blue focused or red focused or white focused? Or At least focused? as of this article in 2020, it seemed like not because it yeah. said no set before or after. Okay. Um, and then, what was I going to say? This set introduced Madness, I believe. No, did it really? Torment, really? I think so. I'm trying to see where I, I lost that in the article now. I'm sorry. Where um, was the wild, where was the mongrel? When was the mongrel printed? Here we go. As the second set in the Odyssey block, Torment took the mechanics and abilities of the first set, Threshold and Flashback, and expanded upon them. Set also introduced a brand new mechanic called Madness. Okay. I'm trying to think of the Madness cards. Basking Rootwalla? Yeah, okay. Is one of them. Fiery Temper. Yeah, Basking Rootwalla is a Torment card. Yeah. Circular Logic. I don't know if we've ever talked about that card. But Not yet. I do okay. want to make a Madness deck. That's only my next thing to build. Because uh, I don't think it's expensive to put together. I think I probably have most of the cards. Because I would see things like Basking Root Wall and be like, oh, 25 cents, and I'd wear a playset. I like this card. This is pretty good. Circular Logic is one blue, two colorless instant. It's a uh, counter of some yeah. type, right? Counter target spell unless its controller pays one for each card in your graveyard. And it has madness for one blue. So you could pay it for its for one blue if you were supposed to discard it. Yeah, also not expensive. We got to do a whole madness episode, Alex, before yeah. I build my madness. madness deck. Space madness. Before I build my madness deck. Okay. Is that is yeah. that Alex's uh, segment was, on the cards of little, torment? Yeah, that was all about. I, I didn't know that thing about how it was supposed to be the black set. And uh, it kind of makes torment. sense now knowing about the, um, the tainted lands and this interesting little four card cycle. <laughs> this made me think. What are the most expensive cards in Torment? Are they powerful black spells? Cabal oh, Coffers. Cabal Coffers. Um, Chainer, Dementia Master, black uh-huh. card. Insidious yep. Dreams, he, black card. Chainer, Cabal Dementia Ritual, Master. Black card. <laughs> Chainer, Dementia Master is apparently the like focal point of the story in the set. Okay. Uh, Chainer's Edict, I've seen this one before. Yep. I got one of those. We talked about this when we briefly reviewed Black Discard in Pre-Modern. Chainer's Edict, one colorless, one black. Sorcery, target player sacrifices a creature. You could flash back. What does the Dementia Master do? I've seen this card multiple times and never really paid much attention to it. Three colorless, two black. It's a creature, a minion legend. I feel like minions shouldn't be legends. Right. <laughs> All, it's 3-3. Three, three. All nightmares get plus one, plus one. So is a horror, we just went through that cycle, they were all horrors. Are horrors also nightmares? Probably not. 
pay three black, pay three life, put target creature from a graveyard into play under your control. So you can steal things from any graveyard. You just have to pay mana and life. That creature is yeah. black and is a nightmare in addition to its creature type. So you get you get to pump it too. One chainer. Darn yeah, it. I like that. I've come across him and I thought that'd be fun to make a nightmare deck with him. And you know what? He was reprinted in Dominary Remastered. So I think you can get the reprints like really cheap. Like these are 15. They were 15 bucks. They're coming down. They're probably going to keep coming down after the yeah. reprint. See but... if I can scoop this for six bucks. Yeah, maybe. look, look, Dominary Remastered. 50 cents. Dominary oh, wow. Remastered Full Art, a buck right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dominary Remastered Old Border, less oh, than a buck. Old Border for seven. That, that's not bad. Yeah. It looks just like the old card, huh? Yeah. And I think, those, I think those prices are pretty accurate, too. This is... Dominary Remastered really was great because of all the... Like if you're like us and you want the retro frame stuff, the old frame stuff, still the original, you know, nicer. But if you can pick up an old border reprint or a black border reprint for like tenfold lower, I mean, come on. If you just want to build decks, yeah, I don't want to have to, yeah, spend mint, ten bucks or cents. Something versus, on this guy. yeah. So come on, it was really great. It was really great for uh, just purchasing play copies uh, of a lot of these uh, old pre modern uh, legal cards. So yeah, pretty sweet. Tip to anybody out there. <laughs> you want to buy some pre-modern cards? Look to see if it was recently reprinted and Dominary remastered. Instead of paying twelve bucks, you might be able to pay seventeen cents. Since this was so much cheaper than what MTG Stocks was telling me, what is the original printing going for? Is it really going for ten bucks right now? Oh. It looked like it, at least near mint, near mint ones. Near mint, ten bucks. Yep, a little bit over ten bucks for big dealers. Even light play, nine nine bucks. Yeah, come on, seventeen cents for the old border versus ten bucks. You just want to build a deck. Steve. Wasn't it seventy? It was 70 cents. on MTG stock, oh, but then when we looked on oh, oh. TCG player, it was really much was lower. Okay. Yeah. See? I'm going to do it again. I'll do it again. Oh, yeah. Darn it. This isn't even showing me the... the Good deal. The, Hot deals. Yeah. Hot deals. Okay, look. Retro frame. Remastered. Dominary remastered. Retro frame. See Near it. mint. 17 cents. 18 cents. 19 cents. <laughs> If you're if you want to go wild, you could pay twenty five cents. If you want to go wild, uh, that's awesome. Anywho, Alex, Anywho. let's talk about some deck building real, real quick. Oh, yeah. Alex, uh, I put together a goblin deck. I finally did it. I put together my goblin deck. Let me pull this up. We're doing deck building and having deck discussions on Moxfield on the show from now on. So this is my yep. Goblin deck as it currently exists. These are all the cards in Moxfield. Actually, I think I forgot. I left something out. There should be one Bloodstained Mire here in place of like one mountain. It's not in its final form. Ideally, I would have, I would have four Bloodstained Mires, but they're like 80, 90 bucks right now. And I don't want to do that because I feel like those things are ripe for a reprint. The Onslaught Fetch Lands. The uh, other cycle of f fetch lands, not the allied, but the enemy ones, they were reprinted like a year ago, and I don't remember what set. And they dropped in price by half. They went from like 80, 90, like down to 40 or bucks or something. I feel like the same thing's probably going to happen with the onslaught fetch lands, right? And they just haven't yeah. reprinted them yet, but they've got to reprint them at some point. They're not reserve list. They're going to do it. People yeah. play them all the time. I don't want to build up like sets of fetch lands. For seventy to a hundred dollars a piece, depending on the fetch lands, and have them all have in price. Yeah, they're going to reprint that. Those. So I'm just waiting. Them. But right now, the goblin deck is pretty standard. 
Uh, and it's a lot of the cards that we already talked about in the Goblin episode. So four Goblin Lackeys, four Mog Fanatics, four Goblin Matrons, which is the one that lets me tutor for a Goblin. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> four Goblin Pile Drivers, which is that one that's protection from blue and gets plus two plus zero with every other Goblin that's attacking with it. The Goblin Ringleader, which is like the, uh, the well, probably my favorite Goblin that gives you like card advantage in a Goblin deck. And is the reason why I took out burn spells from the goblin deck. Yeah, okay. <laughs> because the ringleader, when he comes into play, you reveal the top four cards of your library. You put all that are goblin cards into your hand. You put the rest in the bottom of your library. So you want to pack, if you pack your deck with goblin cards, this gives you really great card advantage. Every time you play a ringleader, you're going to be putting three, two or three cards in your hand for the most part. Skirk Prospector, because it was another one drop and it gives me some mana if I sacrifice it and I want to add, you know, play something faster. Mm-hmm. And then I have like some toolbox goblins and I get with my matron, the sharpshooter, the one that pings, does one damage. Yep. And untaps as as something goes into the graveyard so you can just fire off multiple rounds. Uh, the Tinkerer to destroy artifacts. The Gem Palm Incinerator, another reason why I removed direct damage because Sometimes you use direct damage for creature removal, right? This guy does creature removal. You can cycle them and deals damage to the number of goblins you have in play to a target creature. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Another reason why you want to pack your deck with goblins. Also, because you have more goblins in play, this does more damage, take out bigger creatures. Siege Gang Commanders, he's in everybody's goblin deck. You put him into play, then you put multiple goblin tokens into play. Here's what our here's where my deck gets spicy. People don't really play Skirk Fire Marshal. I want to play Skirk Fire Marshal. He's three colorless, two red, two two protection from red. You tap five untapped goblins you control. He deals ten damage to each creature and player. I have dreams of just playing this guy, and when I think I'm gonna lose, I'm just gonna blow up the whole board, and then we're gonna draw. That will that will that will bring me a lot of joy if I can just do that. <laughs> it sounds like, like the thing kind of thing that would bring you a lot of joy. Just like over and over, I'm just go scorched earth and be like, okay, no one wins. <laughs> no one wins. And then there's reckless one, three colorless, one red. He has haste. His power and toughness are equal to the number of goblins in play. So I don't know. Like he has the potential to get huge. Mm-hmm. Nobody really plays this card though. I don't know if I want to play this card. I'm thinking. I might take him out and add a non-goblin card. But this non-goblin card interferes with my whole goblin synergy. Right. One less goblin to do an extra right. damage with my gem palm incinerator. One less goblin to pull a goblin when I play my goblin ringleader. But it's really cool. So I just don't know if I should play it anyways. People don't really play it. It is called. I like it since it has haste. It's almost like a direct damage card. You're going to play it situationally when you already have a lot of goblins down. So... You can kind of be like, I know this is going to be 7-7, seven, seven, uh, and it has haste, so I'm going to use this as like a big chunk this turn. Let's say if, let's say I play him on turn four, too, the first turn I can get him out, or three if I have a Prospector that I sacrifice. But then I sacrifice a Prospector, then he loses one power, one toughness, the Reckless one, because there's one less Goblin to play. Let's say I play him turn four. The most Goblins I could have out are three already, so he could come out 4-4, four, four, for four mana, turn four. Not bad, but then he has the ability to get much bigger. But if I do take him out, this is what I'll put in. I keep going back and forth, and I think what I might do is just just sometimes keep him in, sometimes not, depending on how I'm feeling that day when I play my Goblin deck. But I saw this card, Goblin War Strike. From, it's a common from Scourge, Alex. Mm-hmm. It's one red sorcery. Goblin War Strike deals damage equal to the number of goblins you control to target player. That's pretty good. So, like, I treat it like a reckless one, but it's damage straight to the face can't be blocked. Right, yeah. So, yeah, it's a, that... It's, it's not a blocker. Because, yeah. It's only one turn. But I feel like in a goblin deck, this thing can help you finish the game one turn earlier. Right, right. Just, you can... You can run through an attack phase and then am I saying this wrong? Can you play sorceries? You can play sorceries yeah, post attack uh-huh, phase. Yeah. Uh-huh. You can attack, do however many games you can do that turn, and then finish sure. them off right at the end with the goblin For sure. Nobody yeah, plays under- this card though. It's tough because you don't yeah, like you said, you're you know, the more spells you put in the the you know the less goblin synergy. 
the the matron thing doesn't work as well and the what's the other card well Not the matron the, the matron's my tutor yeah the yeah, gem palm the incinerator that... gem palm incinerator okay. with the direct damage and then there's I was the goblin of... ring the goblin the ring leader. that's the one i was thinking of yeah the other thing I was going to mention, but again, this is a spell, so you probably you might not want it, is the Brightstone. <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Brightstone Ritual. I think I showed this to you already. It's one. It's a one red instant, and it adds a red to your mana pool for each goblin in play. Oh, yeah. So. And that's that's probably even more indirect than the last card you just had up, so it's, pr it's probably yeah. not as good. Like, yeah. This will help you get out a big creature, maybe if you want, like one of your bigger casting cost goblins. But the other one's definitely a little better as a finisher. I think so. Yeah. Since you don't have direct damage, you know, direct Since damage, I don't have direct X damage. spells in your deck. Yeah. This would be good, like in a goblin deck from back in the day, where you also ran, like you said, an X spell or two. Yeah, you had fewer two. options, uh, and uh, you know, you had to play with a bunch of crappy goblins, maybe, and then you could use that to fuel your fireballs and stuff and this was onslaught i feel like this is before goblins got super cray yeah like these goblins are legions lackeys urzas no nope. was onslaught onslaught was after urzas yeah onslaught's later okay pile drivers onslaught too ringleaders apocalypse ringleader's the thing that's really crazy in this deck it seems like to me the ringleader pretty late onslaught is only legions and scourge are after onslaught. They're in the same block. It goes onslaught, legion, scourge, and apocalypse is after it too, right? I don't think so. Not according to this. Oh, okay. Apocalypse is not an odyssey. Odyssey is odyssey, torment, and judgment. Okay then. I was just bringing that up because I thought maybe this card would have like more use cases back when it was printed, right. But no, not really. It's... I like that it gives you red mana too because like. Back in my old goblin deck, I had ball lightning. Mm -hmm. So you could use that, oh, yeah, yeah. cast a ball lightning and something else. You know what I mean? Uh, Apocalypse is in the invasion block. It's even earlier, Steve. It's invasion, plane shift, apocalypse. Okay, then. I did not know that. I knew, I knew it was the, that block because I just remember IPA. It's the IPA block. Yeah. But I don't remember. I couldn't remember if it was before or after the onslaught block. But I think I'm going to do it. I think I'm going to put the war strike in. And I think the only thing that would come like out. Like just one? Is, yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to replace the one reckless one. Because like I said, it can do as much damage as, a rec as an unblocked reckless one can do in one turn. I guess minus one. Because the reckless one itself is also a goblin. So it gets plus one plus one for itself just being a goblin. But I think this is going to... I want it because it'll help me end the turn one game, one round sooner. I feel like it could in a lot of cases. I also like the fact that if, you, let's say you're playing Goblin multiplayer game, you can attack one opponent and then send all uh, the Goblin War Strike damage to a second opponent. Sure. You could send it two different directions, same turn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The only other thing that I would take the Reckless one out for is maybe a Goblin Goon. So let's say I, I didn't want to let's say I didn't want to go I didn't want to go reckless one but I wanted to keep a goblin in so as not to decrease my goblin synergy I would go goblin goon It's a rare from legions three colorless one red 6/6 six, six. Can't attack unless you control more creatures than defending oh, yeah, player can't block unless you control more creatures than attacking player Most of the time when you're playing with goblins you will have more creatures so this is situationally good. I'm sure, sometimes I'd get it out and I'd be screwed, depending on who I'm playing and what kind of deck they're running. But most of the time, I think this card would work for a goblin deck. But I like the war strike. I like I like the idea of just being able to double up my damage in well, one turn. Could one you take out maybe a? Uh, I really like hole breach. If I saw you had two, you could maybe run one hole breach. I could. You I don't even. Tinker, yeah. And then the whole have, breach would get rid of enchantments, but. I have the Tinker and a Matron. <clears throat> and what? Yeah. And a Matron. So, base and Matron. So, basically, what I'm saying is, I was almost like I have four Tinkerers. Not as good as having, not as good as having four Tinkerers, 
because if you right. kill one, then it's gone. But you know, I could use her to search for a tinker whenever I want. Yeah. I, okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, I I always <laughs> now I'm coughing. I always like to just as a default in my deck have like two things with a disenchant ability, like two. Uh, oh, me too. I, I think or, yeah. But I, I don't like need that's to. A crucial removal. Like you could just go straight to the face first game. I could just. That's put what two I was strikes, thinking. Yeah. Just because of the type of deck this is, it's so it would be so fast that you might not need to worry as much about that. You know. I just need to worry about cop red, but that's usually a uh, sideboard in anyways. Not usually. Yeah, or things you're, like that. You're facing game well, one. Well, I mean, I don't know. There's. Like, I feel like there are, I know we're talking about pre-modern now here, so certain things wouldn't apply like moat, but like, you know, there are enchantments that could like shut down your play. Yeah, definitely. You know, in a, in a bad moat. way. Yeah. Huh? Teferi's moat. Which yeah, or any, anything like that. Some kind of enchantment that stops attacking, you know, mm-hmm. stops untapping, stops. There's humility know. in white, which is everything's, all creatures are 1-1 one, one and they lose abilities. They lose special. Or like <laughs> fog type. What's the white card that's like mm-hmm. fog? Uh, is that that's not humility, is it? I forgot. Uh-huh. It no, it's not. It's not humility. There's a green. I think a lot of people in green run elephant grass. Yeah, there are a ton of enchantments that can definitely shut this down. Elephant grass is one green cumulative upkeep of one black. Oh, never mind. That's just black creatures. Don't have to worry about elephant grass in a goblin deck. Humility. Each creature loses all abilities in a one one is in a one one creature. I mean that yeah, yeah. really hurts a <laughs> really hurts a goblin deck. Forget the goblin synergy. There. There's a card, I think it's like a white enchantment, and it has an ability that costs zero, and you can have no creatures do damage. I don't know. Um also Orem's Prayer, something like that. It, uh gain one life for each attacking creature. Like your opponent okay. would have that down. That would be terrible. Um, there's also terrible. there's a one there's a, a white card too that just like says you can't lose the game. If, and if you go below zero one life okay. or something. No, it's not wonder. But yes, the point is there are there are a lot of terrible enchantments. They can so just yeah, I'm not sure if I up. believe in my own advice there. Like you might want to have two cards that get rid of enchantments i was actually going to put two more in my sideboard you know you yeah i definitely would i would have like up to four including your sideboard you know what i've also noticed the green red goblin in pre-modern is the most it seems like it's at least now the most common color scheme oh yeah green red versus just mono red and it is always so they can put in something that removes uh enchantments and artifacts but almost everybody's running with naturalize. And I was actually watching a YouTube video the other day and there's somebody made a comment specifically about that. And the guy said, Oh, I don't like naturalize. I mean, I don't like Hall Breach as much as naturalize in, in this deck for this reason. He didn't say for this reason. He didn't give the reason. And I was like, what is that? What's the reason for it? Cause when I saw Hall Breach, I was like, why don't more people run this in the red green goblin deck? Cause Hall Breach, you can take out an artifact and an enchantment. But you don't have to have an artifact and enchantment on the board to take out. You could also just target one. So, like, why not yeah, put this in if you can two for one? I don't get what naturalize gives you over hull breach. The only difference is that it's an instant, and a hull breach is a sorcery. So, I'm trying to think what situations this guy ran well, into where okay. he wanted to cast the yeah. naturalize on his opponent's turn. That could be important. I mean, yeah. you know, if they bring out a new artifact or in creature that turn that gives them like their win condition or something yeah you know then you can't hull breach it so that's important i'm trying to think of how many times i would run into that situation obviously this person did run into that situation or he wanted to have removed hull breaches and replaced them with naturalize yeah but that's another thing that i might do but yeah so i, I still don't know I'd what try I'm one dis- and one i've decided i'm going to uh looks good put the goblin war strike in instead of the reckless one and then maybe i'll reverse my decision at some point but i think it it might be a little safer because with reckless one like yeah you're gonna have a lot of goblins in play generally but there might be times where the number dips if there's a board wipe if you have a bad combat all of a sudden now you like his 
you know, power and toughness drop again because you've lost a lot of goblins. You had yeah. to sacrifice some mob fanatics, you know, whatever. In um, those cases, the war strike isn't much help for me either. But is the war strike a instant? An instant? Because it, let, it yeah, let's was. let's say somebody did pull a wrath of God out on me or something. Because I thought I thought of that when you had it up that you could use it like as a, you know, a reaction to someone yeah. killing all your goblins. But I might have been wrong there. Ah, it's a sorcery. Oh, ah. darn it. Yes, I was wrong. <laughs> if only it was an instant. Also, if only I could target creatures with it, too, like Goblin Grenade. That would be way too good. Goblin Grenade was already yeah. too good. And Goblin Grenade maxed out at five damage. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do it. I just want to. What is... Uh... Fire, aim, ready. They're doing it backwards out. I just wanted to, I was re- trying to m- remind myself what Powder Keg did. I'm still trying to get some of these, but I haven't gotten any yet. Um, uh, uh, it wreaks havoc on goblin decks. Yeah. It's a two, two casting cost. You put a counter on it every turn, and then you sacrifice the artifact to do, sorry, to destroy every artifacting creature with mana cost exactly equal to the number of counters on it. Yeah. So you can use it to destroy all low casting cost or, or all big casting cost creatures yeah. and artifacts. Everything um, in this deck is one, two, three, or four. But it's a pretty good mix. Yeah, that's a good mix. I was thinking of this. I was only bringing this up because it actually has pictures of <laughs> goblins in it. <laughs> and I was wondering if it would have a place in your deck. Like it could ah, help, okay. But, Not against it. Yeah. It wouldn't be bad, but it's another card now that isn't a goblin. So Yeah. Yeah, I'm not running any artifacts. I don't know if I would. No, that's fine. If you don't feel like, you know, there's some obvious reason to, why not? Just, you know, then then you have that, like, advantage how you had in that one game we were playing where I was like, you know, I had some artifact removal card in my hand. You had, like, nothing. It was in worthless. It yeah, worthless. 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 <laughs> what artifact yeah, looks removal? looks good, though. I think it looks good. You remember what artifact removal you had? Because I did have enchantments, and that deck was full of enchantments. I can't remember. I did have a steel artifact in there. I know oh, that. Okay, I was doing doing nothing. That was too much. Not expensive to build either. The lackeys were the most expensive thing. How about that sharpshooter? Oh yeah, but I only bought one. Okay. And it's more expensive than it is. It's more expensive yeah, now than when up. I bought it. Yeah. How much are the lackeys? I, they might have been like 15 bucks or something. Oh, okay. Let me see yeah. what they are now. I feel like often it's you know, $18. I think I got them like 15 Cool. Yeah. October, October, November. It's they were 15 uncommon. It is. And they don't reprint it very often. It's got to be reprinted at some point soon, right? The reprint is the Secret Layer series with art that I really don't like. When are they going to reprint it? Are they going to wait till it goes to a hundred bucks? <laughs> <laughs> what I've noticed, Alex, recently, no one knows. I'll have to look through more sets, but I just started looking at some Tempest cards this morning mm-hmm. because you know, for the past six months, everything's been dipping. And I'm like, oh, I wonder how far things are going to go. Are they going to get back down to their 2020 price? prices back close to where they were pre psycho COVID spike where everything tripled or more. And what did you discover? Unfortunately, a lot of the Tempest cards that I I was kind of interested in picking up like the medallions, they've started going back up again. I was looking at medallions. Things are going back up again, Alex. What is happening? (laughs) Don't people know? Well, and ancient tomb too. Yes. I just had to check to make sure that was in Tempest because I couldn't remember. But since you mentioned Tempest cards going back up, yeah, Ancient Tomb is frustratingly expensive. And the medallions are frustratingly expensive. I haven't checked other sets to see if everything's just trending that way, but I fear that maybe it is. And I, I, it came to my mind when I saw this dip in Goblin Lackey, but now it's it's at all-time highs again. What pisses me off about the medallions is that they're rares. Yeah. And they're all none of them are outrageously expensive. They're like 
20 to 40 dollars i think yeah they shouldn't be that much that's too much like if i want four for a a mono color deck like i do for a white deck it's frustrating yeah and it's like they're they're probably only that expensive because they're rares in that set and i was but it was annoying me because i was looking at like the you know just like your your estimated value if you're like opening packs or something like that compared to pack price and i'm like what's a pack of tempest cost and like what could i get out of it and i'm like ah like all the medallions in there are taken up a rare slot. And I think a pack of Tempest is a hundred dollars. You oh, know, geez. so it's like, that's There's not only, very... how many cards in Tempest even have a market value of a hundred bucks or more. One, One? intuition. Yeah. Uh, and ancient, the only, the good thing is that ancient tomb is an uncommon. So okay. you could draw an ancient tomb and a, a lot of the card, you know, a lot of sets are like that, like alliances, force of will. You could get that in the uncommon slot, yeah. you know, and it's a, one of the big, you know, just about the most expensive card in the set. This is all grading's fault. We've talked about this before, the ridiculous price of sealed packs. It's just, it must be because people are like, oh, I'm going to get this graded. And then somebody will want to buy a 9.5 for a, whatever the yeah, premium it definitely, is. Yeah, it but definitely then you have to allows pay to get it graded to, too. to bake like, some more hell? value into like what you're charging for the pack. That and foils, although this is, we're talking about pre-foil still here, but. Yeah, uh, then you have to you have to pay to get it graded, and for a card that's like fifty bucks. Yeah, I see people up with. Like, I don't, I don't get, get it. it. Like how they paid to have there's like, like you know, cards that are ten or fifteen dollars or twenty dollars, and they're paying to get them graded so they can charge. I don't. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. But yeah, um, Tempest has Intuition and Earthcraft at above a hundred dollars, and then Ancient Tomb, which is an uncommon. Then you got Ella Damry, Lord of Leaves, who you can't even play with, right? Isn't or no? I'm confusing him with uh, Rofellos or Rofellos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's who I was thinking of. But Ella Damry, I was looking at him this morning too, and I was like, eh, like this would be kind of a fun casual card to play, but it's not. I'm not paying sixty bucks for it. <laughs> it's good. good. I mean, it's. I don't know. I think it's good for an elf deck, but it's yeah, it's, it's expensive. It's yeah. yeah. I wouldn't buy it right now. So, yeah. Yeah. Also, Lotus Petal is a common in Tempest, so that's good. It's been going up okay. in price. It's like okay. 25 bucks now or something. So Okay, we got that going Sometimes the, the you have to consider that sometimes, like look at the, what the most expensive commons and uncommons are, but it still doesn't make sense. The packs, sealed packs are still so... Like, I really want to get some old packs to open for fun. Like, that would be cool huh. to me, just to, you know, for sentimental fun, but at the prices they are it's prohibitive yeah it's crazy sad i don't remember what i was looking at the other day but i was seeing somebody talk about how they paid to open up a pack of revised it was like a big purchase that they made they wanted to open up a pack of revised and i was just thinking how crazy that seemed to me because <laughs> it seems so crazy to me because <laughs> i don't know i don't remember how much they are now but they're they're over you know you could you they're, could pull an underground bucks. seat Yes. They might be 500 bucks now, 400, 500 bucks. Something like, like that. Because people are like, oh, you could pull a wheel. Yeah. You could pull an They're the price seat. of a dual land. Uh, fucking crazy, man. But I it's can't just like, it. like you, yeah, the, the set, so Revise is a big set. There's a lot of rares, and most of them, you know, the only things that are in there that are worth money are Wheel of Fortune and the, the dual lands. Anything else you pull from the set will be a dud in the rare slot. There's a lot of stuff you really don't want to pull after you pay five hundred dollars for a yeah. revised pack, or even a hundred. Even the bucks best other revised. cards in the set, like what, like copy artifact, like fifty-five bucks. <laughs> yeah. You know, like oh wow, I got fifty bucks back from my. Also, I just remember opening them. I mean, we remember opening them back in the day. There was nothing yeah. special about a revised. That's pack. what I was going to say. Is like we're too close to the issue. I think we've had enough experience opening packs of revised that we know like how many bad packs of revised you will open before you get a dual land. <laughs> And I mean, I'll just always remember being irritated that I couldn't open a pack that had Power 9 in it because yep. I just missed Unlimited. I'll be like, now yep. I'm stuck with this bullshit. <laughs> yeah, getting this crap could have been, yeah. <laughs> Anywho. Saw packs uh, so- of alliances for 60 bucks the other day. I think that, I thought that was not awful. Oh, okay. I thought it's you were going to start going on a rant about how you remember splitting a box with bj and yes, all the crap yeah. he got out of that's it that's the thing I, again though it's yes yeah, it's, it's a pretty big set and there's a lot of crap cards in it like you get lake of the dead but geez the only way you're saving yourself there is getting a force of will out of yeah. the alliance pack 
a helm and a force of will, a lake of dead and a force of will. That'd be sweet. Yeah. Anyways, Alex, let's begin our final segment of the day. Our final segment of the day is the Old Men Magic Commander Corner. This is where you and I add a new card to our first ever Commander decks that we're building. Pump them up. They are going to be terrible decks. They are going to have old frame only cards because that's pretty much all we have at the moment. I don't. I haven't purchased any new frame cards. So we're building our first Commander decks with cards we have at the moment. Although I'm buying cards for this, but it doesn't require me to buy all the cards for it. a lot of it. I had at least the, ba- the base stuff. But this is what I have so far. My commander is Jock DeVert. And I'm making a creature-based green deck. So far, what I've added are manimals. I've added things that pump up my creatures to complement the effect of Jacques Levert, who makes my green creatures tougher. I have a Keza to give everything, to give all green creatures plus one, plus one. I have a Wyoli Wolf to pump any creature in play, plus one, plus one. I have a Stampede Driver that can give it trample or pluses. I have the Elvish Herder to give a trample. I have a Scavenger Folk to destroy artifacts. I added some enchantments last week, Alex, or a Shards. This can make, this can give all my creatures enter the battlefield ability to destroy artifacts or enchantments when they enter the battlefield. I added Yavamaya, Fires of Yavamaya, which gives my creatures haste. It can also pump them. I added Mirari's Wake. It gives all my creatures plus one, plus one. It also gives me more mana. I have. Pendlehaven, Alex. I can tap it to give a creature plus one, plus two. All I'm going to do is play creatures pump, play creatures pump. I lied. That's not all I'm going to do, Alex. Today, I'm adding something that doesn't pump my creatures. I'm also adding something that is not green. Alex, I'm adding one of the big hits from the revised edition. Wheel of Fortune, not to brag. I have a revised Wheel of Fortune, not to brag. This is one of the cards that I didn't throw I'm going to put it in my deck, too. I mean, <laughs> yeah. may as well put it in your deck if you have it. So not much to say here other than, you know, if I empty my hand with all my all my small creatures, I get everything out and play. want to draw another seven. I'm going to play my Wheel of Fortune. Revised Wheel of Fortune. Crazy to me that this card is so expensive these days. Yeah. But it is because they be decided $8. not to reprint it. Come on, people. Reprint everything, wizards. <laughs> reprint everything alex what are you going to add today that's my Ooh, look look at i, I have a couple red. options i added huh? a new color to my deck look at that alex my first yeah episode. yeah a little splash of red in there beautiful um geez, a couple things i could talk about i'm not sure which one really to, to add um i'm pulling up your deck now oh do you like how we transitioned to moxfield now instead of just my powerpoint yes yes it's <laughs> <That's> much better <laughs> um i'm working on a group hug deck uh yeah. I'm going to try to manage my idea with this uh, to recap is to, you know, I want to keep everyone around in the game as long as possible. I want to try to keep a balanced table so that, you know, other people aren't dying too quickly. I want to keep the other players happy with me so they aren't attacking me until I'm ready for my win condition. No um, one's going home. You're going to keep people there as yeah, long as possible. You're going to make them really playing hungry, them against each other, thirsty. keep everyone in the mix. When they're Everything, fully dehydrated, then that's want, when you attack. Yes, I want balance across the board. And so I was thinking, there's so many cards you could do, you could use in a deck like this. And I'm thinking that I want to try to lean towards making my permanence the cards that the other players like. Um, I was thinking about putting Arcane Denial in, for example, the other day, which is a counter spell, but your opponents draw cards. Mm-hmm. Um, I still might put that in because it's good, allows me to draw a card too. I'm not sure yet, but I was kind of thinking I want my permanence more than my spells to be helpful to my opponents because the permanents are down on the table. They're reminding people not to attack me. They're giving some sort of continuous benefit to the table. Maybe Um, I want that to be what's, you know, like uh, fulfilling that goal rather than having to waste a card out of my hand to help one of my opponents. Mm -hmm. I want them to not really realize at first that my, instants and sorceries might be more to my advantage than to theirs. Do you see what I'm saying? The permanence out on the the table will be sort of like the smoke screen. Um, 
So there's a few cards like that, like Arcane Denial, that I sort of have come across that I'm kind of like maybe leaning away from at the moment. Uh, but I'll keep thinking about it. Um, as for cards to add, I'm going to add a Maze of Vith. I didn't add that yet. Um, it's good because I can use it for other people attacking other people. If you're attacking Billy Bob and I don't like that happening, I can Maze of Vith your creature to protect him. Well, I'm going to be pissed at you if you do that. Yeah, yeah. If you maybe, screw me maybe, to protect maybe, Billy Bob. Maybe. maybe. Billy but Bob I, 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 but Bill, your Billy co-host. How, <laughs> How long have you known Billy Bob, Alex? We go far, much further back than Bill, you and Billy Bob. I can't believe you do that to me. Is that what we're adding today? Are we, are we adding yeah, yeah, that's today? that's one of them. I'm going to add another from the too. dark. I'm assuming um, from the, the dark. dark right? Yeah, the dark. Oh. Look at that, look at Looks that so beautiful good. brain. Looks I don't so know good. what it is. That's, half brain, like half like intestine. A, almost like it's intestine, a, yeah. It's a sack full of intestine. Some big, big amoeba-like thing that swallows yeah. you, but it has intestines instead of being single-celled. That's um, how it digests you after it. Let's throw up. I just found this card, and maybe I'll take it back out, but it looks fun for now. Karmic Justice. Tell me what you think about this. No. Oh. Karmic are we, Justice. Are we putting it's, it in? Yeah, let's put it in for now. I can always take it out. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, it's from. It was in a commander set, so I oh, feel yeah, like people okay. like it in commander. Uh, it's from Odyssey. Uh, oh, did I? Okay, cool. It's two colorless, one white enchantment. Whenever a spell or an ability an opponent controls destroys one of my non-creature permanents, I may destroy a permanent that they control. So it's kind of like just you know having a little force fieldy action up to protect me. People won't want to mess with my permanents, um, and like I was just saying, I want to have permanents down as my group hug element. Uh, so I'll put this out to discourage people from messing with me. So if I play my aura shards and then I play a query on rager and I said, Alex, I'm destroying your howling mine. Then you can destroy something that I have now. Yes. Any permanent too. It could be any yeah. permanent. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> he says. You you look like you're considering something. No, I just I was, I was trying to think how would this because we were just talking about the goblin deck and how maybe I can remove the hall breaches and thinking about enchantments. I'm like, how would I feel if somebody played this enchantment against my goblin deck? So uh, you what probably wouldn't of, care too much, right? I was I was just that's what I was thinking. I was like, oh, if they had an artifact out that I really needed to get rid of, and I played my tinkerer, then they could destroy whatever they wanted from mine, from my board. My Jim Palm Incinerator, if I use it to nail a creature, then they could destroy something on my board. But wouldn't it be like a particular prize? It wouldn't be one of the worst enchantments yeah, that I have to do. Yeah. We're in the Goblin deck specifically. Yeah. Ray Lago. I kind of like that art. This looks almost like the beginning of a Bob Ross painting. Mm -hmm. Just the early stages. Yeah. Like we're 10 minutes into the episode. <laughs> And then he covered it in fog. He's like, I don't have to do more work. <laughs> Use that fog to your advantage. <laughs> also today, Steve. Oh, um, you're adding three today. Okay. Did I add two already? But I, what was the first one? Maze of it. Oh, Maze of it. Yeah. You can add three. Some days That's, I, I Maze of it is like an auto include for me in like a deck. So I, I put okay. that in there. Um, I already forgot my card. Dang. Oh, uh, I want to put, since I was talking about the, the permanence, uh, doing this work for me as far as like the like helping my opponents or, or keeping them satisfied i'll probably end up with some enchantments in this deck mm -hmm. um so i'm gonna put and it's gonna be mostly like green blue white i think although i keep finding more red cards i want to add um but i think i'll throw a femoref enchantress in and femoref enchantress i was Just gonna femoref. say oh <laughs> i'm sure it'll come up <laughs> Femoreth enchant. I was going to say, Alex. There's so many different colors going on here. Uh huh. I'm gonna it's be kind of a mess. I'm worried I'm that I'm, going, I'm just going to have blah. I'm going to be interested to see how you're going to work this out mana wise in I a know. world where I you can only have, have one of each dual lane. And, and then also. In a world where you probably can't afford to buy even one of each dual land, right? Because <laughs> it's because yeah. you're you're gonna need an underground sea in a volcanic island. I'm really trying to stick with stuff that only has like one 
of a color in the casting cost. I broke yeah. that with if Biff already, but <laughs> I could take him out. He's 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 in there for fun. He's kind of a meme card in there. Memoriff Enchantress. One green, one white, one two, summon Enchantress. I believe this is reserve list. It is. Whenever an enchantment is put into any graveyard from play, draw a card. So everybody, right? So anytime anybody, any any we're playing a four player deck deck. Yeah. Anytime any enchantment goes to any graveyard, everybody gets to draw a card. Is that how that works? Uh, no, I get to draw a card. Oh, this is rude. Where's the group hug aspect? <laughs> oh, there's that? no group hug in this card. This is just to help me. Okay, as soon as you let as soon as you put that on the board, I'm I have a hundred cards. Some of them have to just be good for me. I'm taking you out <laughs> as soon as this comes down. <laughs> this ain't doing anything for me. You're out of here, buddy. But it makes you not want to destroy my enchantments. It makes me want to eliminate you. It makes me want to take you from 40 <laughs> life to zero. <laughs> out here sit out here sitting down be like i'm playing a group hug dog deck and then turn two you're playing something that only helps you out i know what you're up to <laughs> yeah what else are you gonna do for mana fixing i mean i have some more you know i'm gonna do some more the pain some more lands, animals exist. some more like you know pain land type lands um there are elves that, exist sure that give different colors like i have the query on elves in my deck it's going to be tough, but like I said, I'm going to try to go with cards that just have one mana of a color for now, at least. I don't know, not, mm-hmm. not too many. We'll okay. see. Yeah, I'll we'll see how it evolves. It. We will see how this evolves. Excellent, Alex. Excellent. That is the end of today's last segment, the Old Men Magic Commander Corner. This is the part of the episode where I'm going to ask you again. If you enjoyed, please subscribe to the channel. Please give us a thumbs up. Hit that notification bell. I don't think I have anything else to say for the day, Alex. Do you have any parting words for the listeners? I don't think so. Oh, you know what? Alex has nothing to say, so I'm going to say a second thing because I forgot. I'm also supposed to tell you that you can find us on Twitter at Old Men Magic. You can also listen to the podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts if you prefer those formats over YouTube. That's it for the day. Next week, I don't know what we're going to talk about, but I think we're going to talk about visions. I think I want to get into some vision segments. We'll get into that vision. Okay. Talk to you next week. All right. Take it easy.